It was the swinging 1970s, the me decade, of free love and self-expression. After dark, Australia sometimes seemed to be enjoying one long party. But in a small corner of the country, the party ended in tragedy. And a haunting mystery that 47 years later still has not been solved. Tonight, we'll reopen one of the country's most baffling cases. The disappearance of Australia's first celebrity chef, Willie Copen, A star of radio and television who ran The Cuckoo, one of Victoria's most famous restaurants. Despite being so talented, he was flawed. Yeah, he was volatile. There's no doubt there was a lot of people who did not like Willie. We'll examine what happened the night Willie vanished. So we've got four main players here that are potentially connected to it. The theories. Where's the body if it's a suicide? I mean, you can't dig a grave yourself and bury it. it. Do I believe he was murdered? Yes. The clues. To me, that jumps out as a motive. He becomes a very important witness, this fella. He would have been in the rickety chair if I was running the investigation. And his family's disturbing dilemma. Was the killer in plain sight? It's the worst question in the world to ask somebody, do you think your mother killed your father? Good evening, I'm Liz Hayes, and this is Under Investigation. Joining us tonight, Sabina Wakefield, Willie's daughter who spent half a lifetime wondering why her father disappeared. It's an awful outcome for a family, and it's an unresolved sort of open wound that really never goes away. And three of the country's most senior investigators to help Sabina find answers. Former Victorian Major Crime Squad detective, Alex Kristich. Alex, can we still crack this case? Of course, there's no such thing as an unsolvable case. There will be evidence somewhere. Valentine Smith, former policeman and the founder of the Missing Persons Network. When somebody goes for that long, are we liable to find them? Absolutely, and history will show that. I mean, we look at Richard III, he was sitting under a London car park for hundreds of years, and there's plenty of cases like that. And Damien Merritt, a former undercover police detective turned private investigator who spent three years examining this case. Damien, you have been always of the opinion that we're looking for a murderer. Oh, definitely. Willie Copen was killed that morning, Sunday the 29th of February, 1976. There is not any doubt in my mind he was murdered and uh, driven away from the scene of the cuckoo. Willie Copen's story begins in pre-war Berlin in 1929. At 14, he becomes an apprentice chef working for the exclusive Adlon Hotel, one of the most famous in the German capital and all of Europe. As a teenage chef, he once made pancakes for the most notorious man of his time, Adolf Hitler. But in 1956, Willie moves to Australia and within a few short years, becomes the country's first famous TV chef. He was a post-war migrant, he was young, he was very talented, he was very creative, very charismatic, he was very good looking. Charming, he was absolutely charming. It's in Melbourne Willie meets and marries his wife, Karen, and they have three children. In the sleepy village of Alinda, in the Dandenong Ranges on Melbourne's outskirts, Willie and Karen purchase a tea house, turning it into the Cuckoo Restaurant. What Willie brings to his restaurant and Australia is a brand new dining experience, the smorgasbord. So the Cuckoo is established and the smorgasbord arrives, Damien. Yeah. 
And look, coming from a big family myself, something like a smorgasbord would have taken off because... It was you know, revolutionary. Absolutely. If, if mum and dad having seven kids, if we could just keep eating and eating and eating, you know, it was the perfect thing. The cuckoo takes off. It's the restaurant of choice for celebrities, even prime ministers. Willie, the master chef, designing the menu. His vivacious wife, Karen, front of house, entertaining the patrons. The reason the cooker did so well was the person driving it in the kitchen Absolutely. was Willie. Well, my mother was the driver of the front door and it was a perfect combination. He did the back door, the food, and she was so charismatic herself. She was the perfect hostess, you know, and she welcomed people, made them feel it's really pretty, special. And duo. so it was a really, it was a dynamic sort so of duo. So it, it, it wouldn't have worked as well as it did unless both were Correct, playing those both. critical roles Absolutely. within the business. Absolutely. So they does did. that mean when they weren't working well, it stopped? No, no, I think by that stage, the the business was a monster in a sense. It became, you know, this all consuming. I don't know how you'd even describe it because so many people wanted to go there. It was so busy and overwhelming in some ways. And they were both, I think, starting to be stretched um, in their roles. But as the cuckoo's fame skyrockets and the money rolls in, Willie starts to crack under the pressure. He's having an affair with a restaurant waitress, Lainey Little, and his wife, Karen, also has a lover. You know your mum and dad are having yes, affairs. Yes, yes. They made so much money, this is the problem, and they're not particularly sophisticated with money, so cracks start to appear. And my father, of course, he was, despite being so talented, he was flawed. And Willie is beginning to drink a lot. He was unpredictable, your dad. Yeah, he was volatile. He was. And what does yeah. volatility mean? Well, he would drink, you know. He's, he wasn't, I guess you could say, he was an alcoholic. Yeah, he definitely was. And he and loved women. He did. He was a very good looking man. And so, and women loved him. It's the 70s. Yeah. This is, this is the mid 70s. Yeah. It was pretty well the Wild West back in those oh, days. Oh, and the, the restaurant was like the Wild I mean, my mother thrived on that party environment, you know, the perfect party every night. So she's loving the party, she loves but Dad's it. downstairs she loves working. the front door. And he doesn't like the party life. He and doesn't like that. He's getting sick it. of it. Your mother would never have wanted to give up the cooking. Oh, never. She? Oh, gosh, no. She loved that business. Valentine? I just see that sort of leading up to the end of 1975, early 76, that there were some, some risks. Already, missing persons investigator Valentine Smith sees a possible crime brewing. Willie's waning interest in the restaurant, the high-profile business that has become Karen's life. There were some risks to, if we want a better word for it, the cuckoo empire. And to me, that jumps out as, as a motive. As this 1970s real-life drama unfolds, some of the cuckoo restaurant's regulars form a tight clique around Karen, including her lover, Melbourne barrister, Tony Benici. Karen and her circle are decidedly anti Willie. Look, he upset people. There's no doubt there was a lot of people who did not like Willie. So, so he had he, enemies? Well, he could cut them like a hot knife with butter. And look, you've got to look at a guy in the 70s. It's very different for him to have affairs and think that's all right. But for his wife to be having an affair and people knowing about it, more, more so, yes. is embarrassing for a guy who's, he, he had a bit of an ego, oh, Willie. Absolutely. And, you know, she, your mother's sitting in the cuckoo restaurant with her boyfriend. I mean, that's a pretty big slap in the face to a 70s male. <laughs> As well as her lover, Karen is often joined by friends Anne Robinson and her partner, the village doctor, Bernard Butler. Butler is also Willie's doctor, whose evidence will become central to this story. You can start to sort of develop these, I suppose, a profile of, uh, of, of all, all the different people and their connection to it, and then you can keep building on it and you come up with motive and opportunities to what may or may not have occurred. 
So we've got the four main players. And what we're starting to do here is pull apart all of the people that are potentially connected to it. And we're talking about a small community too, aren't we, Alex? Well, we are, but there's a couple of camps here. You've, you've got the Karen camp, is uh, the doctor, uh, Robinson. Barrister. Uh, the barrister and a number of others, including some employers. Mm -hmm. And in Willie's camp, there's not a whole lot. If you look at the file, he's, he's got two friends in, on earth, apart from his family, and everybody else works for him. And he's building resentment at seeing his yep. wife having a good time. Yeah. They're in the restaurant a lot. I just seem to remember Butler being there all the time with his partner, enjoying the generosity of my parents. My parents were incredibly generous and my father was slowly being alienated. You've got a scenario of Willie working fairly hard in the kitchen. Very hard. Providing this high level of quality food. Absolutely. And coming yeah. upstairs and seeing the party. And uh, these are the sort of things that we need to I suppose, have regard to when we're assessing what Willie's frame of mind may have been and the circumstances surrounding his disappearance. Coming up... The evidence suggests that Willie's had a lot to drink. Willie Copen's final night. What Willie has been saying is that there's a three-way going on. Who was with him? So that's a conflict of interest. When he vanished. I mean, this is the start of the contradictions in statements to police. That's next on Under Investigation. It's the swinging 70s. And celebrity chef Willie Copen owns one of Melbourne's most successful restaurants, The Cuckoo, high in the Dandenong Hills. But Willie's life is unravelling. Both he and his wife Karen are having affairs, and she's surrounded by a small group of friends who Willie seems to increasingly find irritating, and who in turn dislike Willie. So we've got the four main players here, and what we're starting to do is pull apart all of the, the people that are potentially connected to it. There's Karen's lover, Melbourne barrister Tony Benici, the village doctor Bernard Butler, who is also Willie's doctor, and Dr Butler's partner Anne Robinson. Did your father ever express his discontent about your mother's friends? Absolutely, and my father was outspoken. You know, he was very blunt and honest with people and he had no hesitation in saying that. If he didn't like somebody or if he thought something, he would say it, often induced by alcohol. And I know that Butler and Benici and Robinson did not like my father. My father was a nuisance to them because he, in some ways, made them all feel a bit uncomfortable. And I remember Robinson saying, you know, he was an awful man. The material that I've looked at indicates that Willie is a womanising drunk. You've got a bloke here that's very high functioning. Yes. So it, it, it tends to be a bit of a, I suppose, a bit of a, a conflict there. We've got a person that's running a very successful business, making lots of money, and at the same time, you've got a bloke that they're saying, oh, he gets drunk and he's nasty to people. We should make the point that Willie and Karen decide they will live separate lives and your dad moves to the cottage at the bottom of the property, is that right? That is right, yep, he did. According to all his friends, he was all over the place during that time. Yeah, he didn't like the arrangement. Former Victorian detective Damien Marrett has been investigating the case for the past three years and interviewed Willie's wife, Karen, just before her death last year. Willie, in mid-1975, was openly saying he wanted to sell the cuckoo and move to a remote dairy farm. Now, you can imagine Karen <laughs> living on a remote dairy farm. It's just not going to happen in her eyes. But what is his psychology? Because he must know your mother doesn't want to do that. My mother always maintained that he would have sold the restaurant many times over. It's only because of me that it's successful, because she was the consistent one and she was stable. I think it was him crying out for help, which I realise now, looking back, this was a person in distress and he was crying out for help and no one was listening. It's Saturday, the 28th of February, 1976. 
the last night Willie will ever be seen alive. The Cuckoo restaurant is crowded with customers. Staff are working away, waiting for their boss. What happens over the next few hours is critical to this investigation. Willie Copen, clearly intoxicated, arrives at about 8 p.m. Witnesses say he's rude, abusive, and spoiling for a fight. The evidence suggests that Willie's had a lot to drink and that he's been unpleasant to a number of people, threatened to sack a couple of people. One of those Willie threatens to sack is longtime employee June Vink, a threat that will assume critical importance later in our investigation. Willie is also casting slurs on his wife and her close friends, Dr Butler and his partner, Anne Robinson. What Willie has been saying at the cuckoo is that Anne Robinson is in a relationship with Karen and Butler. As a friend, oh, he's, he's implying. You know, th a three-way going on between those uh, three people. That gets back to Bernie Butler and Bernie's furious. He even admits he was angry. Dr Butler heads to the cuckoo, intent on confronting Willie over his slur about the alleged threesome. He later tells police that on the way, he picks up a drug called Melaril, an antipsychotic medication used to treat schizophrenia. Willie, it's believed, has never been diagnosed with the condition something Dr Butler would have known, given Willie, the man he was going to confront, was also his patient. So that's a conflict of interest. So it could be seen as a conflict of interest between whether or not he's going there as a, someone going to calm someone else down, just as an as a associate or oh, a friend like a, or whatever. Or really, he's going it's there like as a, a sledgehammer practice. in the forehead. I wish we could get in the mind of Dr Butler and what he was going to do with that drug. But we, we, we would surmise that it's not malintent necessarily, that he's gone and to pick up a drug that he presumed might help calm Willie down. Yeah. But when he gets to the restaurant, he says that Willie greets him like an old friend. Bernie oh, Butler's the only know. person who says he was greeted like an old friend. Oddly, according to Damien Merritt, far from confronting Willie, Dr Butler settles in for a friendly drink. But I mean, this is the start of the contradictions in Bernie Butler's statements to police. According to witnesses, Butler and Willie move outside to a small balcony attached to the restaurant. Butler later tells police he doesn't give Willie the drugs he's brought with him. As the night drags on, staff close up and leave. Dr Butler and Willie stay and continue drinking. It's now 1.30 in the morning, Sunday, February the 29th. Because I think in the statement that Dr Butler makes, he says on the balcony he and Willie discuss all sorts of things right. about how he is feeling, his depression. So how do you read this meeting between Dr Butler and Willie out on the balcony at the restaurant? There's obviously some sort of communication and connection with them on the balcony at that time. Mm. Well, one thing I did note was that the doctor said that he was pouring his wine over the balcony. So he says, I'm not drinking to the extent that Willie's drinking. And he's still got the loaded gun in his pocket, which is the Melleral. What are we told? What does Dr Butler tell us? Well, Dr happens? Butler says that um, he heard from a staff worker there that Willie had said to her, if I had the guts, I'd throw myself off the, um, the balcony of the cuckoo, which is a, a throwaway statement. Everyone knows he was pissed off about things. He was uh, depressed and whatnot. And drunk. And drunk. He was very drunk. Dr Butler later tells police that he invites Willie back to his place to continue the night and 20 minutes later, despite being extremely intoxicated, Willie drives from the cuckoo to Dr Butler's surgery. So according to Dr Butler, he goes back to the surgery. He's there for about an hour. They keep drinking, is that right, according to the statement? Yeah. Butler tells police that he decides to get Willie to go back to the surgery because he's worried for his welfare that he might throw himself off the balcony 
But then in saying that, he cares so much that he leaves before Willie, and Willie doesn't leave for another 20 minutes, according to him. So That's he's, given, he's given Willie 20 minutes to jump off the balcony. You're a lawyer. I know. You're I a daughter it... and you're a lawyer. Correct. What are the holes up to well, this point for you? That... I, I cannot accept that my father was capable, even capable, of getting in his van. The issues that I have is that the fact is you're already in a, a licensed premises that contains significant amounts of alcohol. To go to the surgery, what, about a kilometre away? Uh, not even. I think less, it's about less, 500 less, metres. Less than oh, a kilometre away okay. to continue drinking, for no other reason but to continue having a drink. It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Even the fact that Dr Butler went with Willie back to his surgery is not corroborated. Well, that um, may, it may never have occurred. I don't believe Willie went back to Dr Butler's surgery. Well, if it did occur, I'd like to ask Dr Butler, you're his treating doctor, he's a person in crisis, all you had to do, th this house had a bedroom, all you had to do was lock him in a room. Why didn't you do that? Why did you let this person who has consumed vast amount of alcohol out on the road again? Like, well, you said he was okay. But that doesn't make sense. He's the, still drunk. He's out of control at 8 yep. p.m. Coming up, Willie's strangely abandoned combi. So would you suggest someone's moved it there after foul play? Yeah, in the course of. And a mysterious dark sedan. Coming around the bend from the cuckoo. This bike is a critical witness. Causes friction at our table. You're he saying, could have been you're mistaken. You're saying the bike's a drunk. No, I'm saying that you can't rely on his exact time. That's next on Under Investigation. It's the early hours of Sunday, February the 29th, 1976. We're investigating the mysterious disappearance of celebrity chef Willie Copen. He's last seen with the village doctor, Bernard Butler, who comes to Willie's restaurant, The Cuckoo, to confront him over a slur he'd made earlier in the night that Butler, his partner Anne Robinson, and Willie's wife Karen are in a sexual threesome. This is the start of the contradictions in Bernie Butler's statements to police. Instead of a confrontation, Butler claims Willie greets him like an old friend. After hours of drinking together at the Cuckoo, Butler says he invites Willie back to his nearby surgery to continue the night. Less than a kilometre away, for no other reason but to continue having a drink. At about 3.30 in the morning, Dr Butler says Willie gets back into his pale blue combi van and drives off into the night. He's never seen again. Willie's wife, Karen, tells her family that Dr Butler claims Willie received a phone call at the surgery just before leaving. And is the inference that after that phone call, Willie leaves because of it? Yeah. According to Butler, Willie is off back to the cuckoo to meet somebody for this mysterious, in the middle of the night meeting. But that's, that's so important. it's not confirmed by Dr Butler. Okay, so what we could have here, and this is it's just hypo hypothetical, what we could have here is an explanation by the doctor in relation to an anticipated question that a lot of people would be asking, was how did anybody know where Willie was? Why did Willie go back to the cuckoo? Because he had a phone call. Now, the thing is, if that phone call was made, I'd be asking questions. Who knew that Willie was at the doctor's surgery? Exactly. Well, that'd be the, the first the... question. It's now around four in the morning on Sunday, the 29th of February, 1976. The cleaner arrives at the Cuckoo restaurant to find Willie's combi van parked strangely against a steep incline. The back sliding door is wide open, the keys dangling from the ignition. The main kitchen doors to the restaurant, near where Willie would normally park, are also open. It's all very strange for a man known to be extremely security conscious. But there's no sign of Willie. 
Inside the car is half a bottle of beer. There's the chicken scraps for the dogs that needed to be fed the next day to take home. And the keys are in the ignition. Now, that looks very suspicious to anybody, just those facts. But the big thing was that Willie had left the back door open, the kitchen door. It was unlocked. And everyone else has said Willie and Karen were both sticklers for everything being locked up tight. And Willie would not, no matter how drunk he was, no matter what was going on, leave that door unlocked. Former Victorian detective Damien Marrett, who spent three years investigating this case, believes Willie may have been attacked beside his van or inside the cuckoo and carried out. Now, if Willie was loading up things from the kitchen out to his car, he would have been using that door, which would have only been four or five metres. So it's the perfect place for somebody to either jump Willie whilst he's loading up the van, not knowing that they had to lock that door, or if something's happened inside the cuckoo, he's been taken out that back door where his combi van is. Valentine, you've been there. You went and had a look. If anyone was servicing or doing something in that car, moving things in and out at that position, they would have had to have been as steady on their feet as a mountain goat, otherwise they would have ended up in the creek. Because of the precarious position of Willie's combi van, missing persons expert Valentine Smith has an alternative scenario. Examining the scene, he believes it's possible Willie's van was moved here by Willie's attacker and parked out of sight to avoid attracting attention. If you were going to put that car somewhere after the fact, if something's happened or whatever, it would be the logical place to put it in that vicinity because you cannot see that, that car park from the road above. You cannot see that vehicle parked there. So if you're driving past or whatever you're doing down there, no one can see. So would you suggest someone's moved it there after? potentially foul play. Yeah, possibly, and that would um, that would create another opportunity or, too. Or in because the course you, of. Yeah, in the course of. What, you, what you're actually doing is you're actually moving the crime scene because you're establishing one there when actually the, the main event, the primary crime scene was over there, somewhere else. The mystery of Willie's disappearance deepens following reports of an unusual car seen early that morning near the restaurant. A dark-coloured, American-style sedan seen by two witnesses. The first is the cleaner, who also discovered Willie's abandoned van. So the cleaner arrives to the cuckoo, yep. and she sees that car, yep. and then she sees Willie's car. Yeah. Just before she arrived there, coming around the bend from the cuckoo, which looked like they'd just left the cuckoo, was a large, what she described as a large, American-style sedan, dark in colour. And there was another witness who claimed to have seen a similar car near the cuckoo at the same time. Philip Fares was the local cop who also played the piano accordion at the cuckoo. He's a witness our expert panel is particularly interested in, not only because of what he saw that night, but also because he was one of Willie's closest friends and his constant drinking partner. This bloke is a critical witness in how Willie's thinking, how he's acting. And in the days leading up to his and, disappearance. And what it, the days, the weeks, the months, anything unusual, any changes in his behaviour. These are the sort of things that would be something that, that I would reasonably expect an investigator to draw from a bloke, especially if the bloke's a copper. And, and he did go uh, for a drive and claimed he did see a car. Well, you know, he, he, he becomes a very important witness, this fella. He would have been in the rickety chair if I was running the investigation. Philip Fares often stayed with Willie and says he was on his way to Willie's cottage in the early hours when he saw the car. At 3.30, Philip Fares says he saw a big black car there. Philip was very drunk. Yeah, yeah. He was always very okay, drunk. Fair enough, yeah. OK. <laughs> well, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't drunk enough not to remember um, what he saw. He yeah. drove yeah. from Fenny Creek. He, he oh, he's a copper. I'm not defending the bloke for one minute, but I'm mm. saying, you know, 
Is he totally you know, unreliable? We don't, we, don't, we don't write people off just because they have a drink. And he's not anticipating, yeah. he's not... He's no, but you, you're not writing him off because he had a drink, but you can, but you can say, sort of you're, say you're he say, could have been you're mistaken. Say, you're saying the blokes are drunk and he doesn't know what he's talking about. No, I'm saying that you can't rely on his exact time. Coming up... Is there anyone in the town who had a car like that? Yes. Huh? <laughs> who owns the mysterious sedan. Did he want to have a go at Willie? And if so, why? Or did Willie deliberately disappear? I mean, I was told, yes, that he'd always said he wanted to fake his own disappearance. There are people alive now that would be able to clarify a lot of matters here. That's next on Under Investigation. Tonight, we're investigating the strange case of Willie Copen, the celebrity TV chef of the 1960s and 70s who disappeared without a trace. He was unpredictable, your dad. He was volatile. There's no doubt there was a lot of people who did not like Willie. Our experts are focusing on a mysterious dark sedan spotted near the Cuckoo restaurant where Willie's combi is later found. There were two cars fitting that description in the area. I was asked a question, who had a car like that that was connected, right? Now, Simon Vink did. Mm. Okay, what could cause Simon Vink to be around the cuckoo that night? Did he want to have a go at Willie? And if so, why? Simon Vink was the husband of June Vink, the employee Willie had threatened to sack earlier in the evening. And according to former Victorian detective Damien Marrett, June Vink was also inappropriately propositioned by Willie that night. June was in the thick of things with Willie's abuse that night. Well, she got sacked by Willie and then reinstated yep. later. Sacked and you can have your job back if you do me some sexual favours and all that sort of crap. So, and it's all very well we say, oh, that's just Willie, it's water off a you know, duck's back. But I mean, these things build up and build up to the point where somebody just says, I've had a freak enough. Well, it's, a, it's an offensive comment. Yeah, well, but not it wasn't that, that unusual back in those days. Are you giving it context again? Yeah, but... Yeah, <laughs> no. yeah look, back in the 70s, yeah, you, you in 2022, say... we'd get all hyperventilated but, about that, but no, back but, in those but, days... But this I think, is a husband. Yeah. Right. Both June and Simon Vink have since passed away. But immediately after Willie vanished, most in this small town in the Dandenong Hills seem to believe Willie had staged his own disappearance, that he'd flown out of the state, out of the country, out of sight. And it was a theory his wife Karen and her small circle of confidants, including her lover, Melbourne barrister Tony Benici, and local doctor Bernard Butler, accepted as likely. Valentine? With your expertise of missing persons, is there anything that you can see about Willie that would support the idea that he has decided to deliberately disappear? It's there, it must be considered, because it's a possibility or a likelihood. At the end of the day, when I look at this, it weighs more towards human intervention in Willie's disappearance than, than, um, than Willie himself orchestrating it. Because your mum mm. and her friends all were saying he's gone off, he's done it before. And that like disappeared, and he, but he comes back and so they're all of the opinion that this is possible. True. Yeah, I mean, I was told, yes, that he'd always said he wanted to uh, fake his own disappearance. I never heard him say that. I never heard my father say that, ever. Perhaps supporting the notion that Willie was unstable and capable of just about anything was a curious letter written by Dr. Butler the day before Willie vanished. It was to the insurance company National Mutual who sought a medical reference for Willie. Dr. Butler's assessment of his patient was startling. He has expressed suicidal ideas, has threatened his wife with a rifle, which on one occasion he fired in the bedroom and has attacks of paranoid delusions of grandeur during which he states he can see through 18 feet of concrete. Now there's this line here, 
He threatened his wife with a rifle, which on one occasion he fired in the bedroom. Now that seems to conflict with the way you've sort Absolutely. of profiled and My described father did your not father. Have, I don't believe he had a rifle in 1975. But, but the document doesn't sound like it's written by by a scientist, by a, a person with a, a medical degree, you know? It, it doesn't look right. Exactly. There's a broad spectrum of things that haven't been answered. And do you think the answer lies within that community? Oh, look, there, there's, there, there are people alive now, I've got no doubt, that would be able to clarify a lot of matters here. Still. And put this, and put this to rest forever. Coming up, Sabino, I have to ask you about your mother. More than 40 years on, I often put it to her, I said, you hated him, you know, you were glad to see him go. How close to home was the prime suspect? It's the worst question in the world to ask somebody, do you think your mother killed your father? That's next on Under Investigation. Tonight, we've investigated what happened to Willie Copen, the colourful, hard-drinking celebrity chef who owned the phenomenally successful Cuckoo restaurant in the Dandenong Hills, and who disappeared in the early hours of a February morning in 1976. For four decades, police and many of Willie's family and friends seemingly held the belief that Willie staged his own disappearance. And it was also what his daughter, Sabina Wakefield, was led to believe. She was 13 when her father disappeared. You know what I can't get over, and you probably more so than anyone, is that just nobody seems to want to invest in where's Willie. No care factor. I know, that's what I find very alarming. And I feel guilty about it now too, that I wasn't more invested in it at the time. It all changed in July 2018, when Victorian State Coroner Judge Sarah Hinchy determined that Willie Copen died on the morning he disappeared, February 29th, 1976, at an unknown location from unknown causes. But Judge Hinchy says she cannot determine who, if anyone, was involved in his death. Over the decades, there have been tantalising leads. An alleged confession to Willie's murder by a jealous rival. Even this anonymous note received in 2020 saying Willie's body was buried beneath a dam owned by Simon Vink, whose wife was apparently insulted by Willie on the night he vanished. Vink also owned a dark sedan very similar to the vehicle reportedly seen near the restaurant in the early hours of the morning. But up until now, it's believed police have not moved on these fragmentary clues, although the case they say is still officially open. There are a number of people who remain key to the investigation, including Dr Bernard Butler, who is believed to be the last known person to see Willie alive, and who wrote this report, which says Willie was very unstable. That's quite disturbing. That document yeah. itself is quite disturbing. Tonight, we can also reveal police were uncertain about some of Dr Butler's evidence. This document from the police file points to investigators questioning Dr Butler about what they seem to believe are contradictory statements. In it, after some questioning, Butler says to police, I am not a pathological liar. But while these curious matters warrant investigation, this too seems a dead end. There is simply not enough evidence to suggest Dr Butler was involved in Willie's death. Perhaps any chance of a resolution to this mystery was lost at the time, with a police investigation that can only be described as underwhelming. It's possible too, the answers lay with Willie's wife, Karen. Looking for answers in the dark, right until the end, she maintained ownership of the cuckoo and had bitterly opposed any moves by Willie to sell it. 
Sabina, I can't imagine how you're dealing with all of this. But ultimately, I have to ask you about your mother. Well, yes, it's interesting. My mother was a really beautiful, dynamic person. She was also very capable and we loved her. She was a really a, a wonderful mother. And believe me, I asked her many times. I cross-examined her on countless occasions and I often put it to her. I said, you hated him. You know, you were glad to see him go. And she said, I didn't do it. But whether she created an environment where somebody else did it, she was good at that. She was actually very good at getting help from people. You know, she was the true matriarch and she was very powerful and people adored her. Her friends were very loyal to her and she was very generous with them. And I would classify a lot of the people as just parasites and sycophants, but she loved that. She absolutely loved it. And she loved that restaurant. Nothing stood in the way of her and her restaurant. I mean, even at 81, I did say to her, it's time to sell. And she said to me, what would I do? Well, if Willie wanted, your dad wanted to sell, mm. that would have caused uh, a motive? Potentially, possibly. It's the worst question in the world to ask mm. somebody, do you think your mother killed your father or participated in it or was part of a conspiracy? And you say? I say, I don't think she killed him. She did not kill my father. But in, did she participate? Was she possibly involved in creating an environment where he was killed? And I would have to say, I don't know. That is a grey area. Karen died last year at the age of 87. Her family and our investigators at the table tonight are left wondering what did Karen know and what secrets did she take to the grave? Um, Alex, when you're looking at suspects, I guess you look at who's going to benefit. Yes. And does Karen stand out as a suspect? Well, with, there's no doubt that she's definitely on, on the list of persons of interest, as they refer to them these days. I know it's unpleasant for a lot of people to think of that, but that, the truth of the matter is that she does stand to benefit from it. And so do those supporting her in whatever it is that she's doing. Um, there's, there's, there's a motive there, there's the ability there, there's a considerable amount of money to pay people to do things. She's definitely a suspect. As for the theory that Willie may have died by suicide, daughter Sabina dismisses it. No, I don't believe he suicided. Do I believe he was murdered? Yes. I'm absolutely <laughs> convinced he was murdered on that night. I don't believe he faked his disappearance. I do not believe he's living in another country. Uh, I believe that he did die that night. He and was murdered. And who do you think bears responsibility? Well, I think there's a number of people out there that I'd like to speak further to, but these particular individuals will not talk. In the wake of Willie's disappearance, the friendships fell apart and Karen's tight circle at the Cuckoo dissipated. There was a bit of a pact between a group of people not to talk about it again even so far in that um, a lot of those friendships stopped at that point in time. Just two of the original group at the Cuckoo that fateful night remain alive. Dr Bernard Butler and his former partner, Anne Robinson. Neither wished to speak to us tonight. And it's unclear whether either could help solve this mystery. It's now 47 years since Willie Copen vanished. People know what happened and people that are still alive may know what happened. We need to focus on that to say, come forward now, help the family relieve some of their grief. There's no closure. There's never closure in these things while there's people that still have memories that are still alive. But bring some relief to the family. Come forward, give us Willie's body. Sabina, what would you say to those people? Look, I'd like to say, um, can you please cooperate? Could you please just give us the opportunity to have that conversation? It doesn't diminish, it doesn't never go away. Does. No, it never does. And I guess only other people that are victims of these types of crimes would know what it's like. It's like an open wound. If anyone who is watching tonight knows anything, please contact Under Investigation through the email on the screen. I'd like to thank you all very much for joining me tonight and I'd like to thank you. I'm Liz Hayes. Good night.
If anything in this program has raised concerns for you or someone you know, please contact Lifeline on 13 11 14 or lifeline.org.au. Hello, I'm Liz Hayes and thank you for watching Under Investigation. Subscribe to our channel now for exclusive clips and don't miss out on full episodes of Under Investigation on Nine Now and the Nine Now app.